okay, Dave, whenever you're ready, sir. This thing set up looks everything looks different with the lights on. <laughs> I want to say thanks for inviting me over, Evans. Uh, this first day I met Evans, you know. How many people here from Ada? So quite a few. So how many of you know me? A few people. So most of you know I'm the guy that owns a music store on Main Street over here. So uh, I'm shamefully advertising that one. On that too. <laughs> but anyway, as uh, I was introduced earlier, I have written a book. Um, I've been interested in the subject since I was a little kid, and there's an interesting story behind that. Everybody's familiar with the Patterson-Gimlin film. I'm assuming you already probably wouldn't be here. But when I was a child, my mother worked for a doctor of veterinary medicine who at the time was in Holdenville, but he grew up in Broken Bow. And in fact, he lived in the old Gardner Mansion that was the old Choctaw Governor's Mansion down there where he grew up in. But in the mid-1960s, he had corresponded briefly with Roger Patterson before the film was made. And he was, and his name is Lewis Stiles, by the way. Sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. But he was not a believer in Bigfoot, but he was very much a hopeful skeptic that, from the scientific point of view, thought this was worthy of documenting. And that's kind of the way uh, I've approached this, too. But anyway, he volunteered his services to Roger Patterson if he ever wanted somebody to come along with him on an expedition, in this case, the horses got hurt. That never worked out, but Roger did send him a copy of the book he wrote, which is, for the biggest part, a collection of newspaper clippings and such called Do Abominable Snowmen in America Really Exist? And when I was a little kid, I knew right on what shelf and what number that book was. <laughs> and uh, even before I read, I'd be thumbing through that, like, wow, this is neat. And then, um, when I was about, oh, I wasn't 10 years old yet, somebody had reported near an area called Yonaby Lake down there closer to Eagle Town, which you can't even get to it now. It's on some kind of wildlife preserve you can't go to. And said that they had seen one of these things down there. I don't remember anything specific about that, but I was like, oh my gosh, they're not just in California. We've got to go there. So under the guise of wanting to go fishing really bad in Yonaby Lake, I convinced Lewis and my dad to take us down there to fish. Of course, when we're fishing, we're in the canoe, and really all it is is a slough. Okay, but if you've ever been down that part of the country, uh, there's a lot of sloughs, we'll call them swamp, whatever, a lot of cypress trees. They're fishing, I'm pretending to fish, and I'm looking in the weeds because I know that this Bigfoot is out there somewhere just waiting. So anyway, that's why I got my interest in that. So um, fast forward to about the mid-1990s. I'm in my mid to late 20s at that time, so I start actively uh, collecting reports that people would send in and stuff. I did a brief... Uh, a uh, couple of investigations with the BFRO in like 2000. Uh, how many of y'all have heard about the, the so-called casino footage that was shot? Okay, well, that inspired me. I was one of the very few people outside of that tribe that was actually allowed in that casino's security room to see that footage. Okay, and that, by the way, I've got a YouTube channel called Bigfoot and More. The, the misinformation about what was really on that video um, inspired me to start this just to debunk it. But anyway, um, I got there, uh, it was me, a gentleman named Roger Roberts, who was a private investigator from Tulsa. He was actually a guy that was in the BFRO, but I was just a uh, contact there. And so we went up there, um, signed release form, got in there to see it. What was actually on it was there was a grease trap out behind this casino, which was out there on kind of the prairie, but there's some wooded areas. This is an area that uh, Evans uh, is close to, but there, there's a long plow peel there. So what, what was on that video, and of course, how many of y'all seen like the night vision type video on security cameras? It's, you know, you can't tell what color things are, you can tell it's dark. So you had this uh, grease trap, it looks like a dumpster, but on top of it, there's a small square lid and there's a light pole beside. I showed Evans a picture of this uh, when he come down today. And what you see at first is a reflection of something like a light coming kind of across a little bit in the parking lot from where it was. And if it, as it gets close to that light, it's almost like it just materializes in there. What you're seeing is either uh, Roger, who was the other fellow that was there, thought it was eye shine. I thought it was a reflection of lights off the top of the 
of the thing's head, which either way, whatever. But anyway, all the video that we were allowed to see is only a few seconds, but it takes a few steps to the, this uh, grease trap and leans over and places its hands on top of it. I've got a picture somewhere of the thing's handprint and the grease on it. But anyway, um, all you can really tell about it, it was very tall, very lanky. I've, I've, I've associated it with like a, if you took a professional NBA basketball player, the way they're built, that tall, muscular look, and cover him with hair, and have him walk in a slightly stooped fashion, that's, uh, that's what it was reminiscent of. Like I said, you couldn't tell what color it was except that it was dark. But we were able to, by the light pole that was right beside this grease trap, which came out kind of angled over it, we were able to measure up nine and a half feet tall on that. Now, to me, that kind of shot down the guy in the monkey suit thing. So, uh, and it's funny what you think when you see something that you consider definitive proof. I've always been interested in that, and the far, first thought that came to my mind was, wow, they really are real. So, anyway, so that was that. Um, and that led to a lot of other investigations that I've done. I, uh, the Travel Channel contacted me. I had a website in the late 90s, early 2000s called southernbigfoot.com, and I had a uh, gentleman from England named Bruce Burgess contact me through that, wanted to know if I would be interested in helping the Travel Channel do a documentary. And I was like, yeah, whatever. You know, I thought, this, this guy's not real, right? So he kept on emailing me and stuff. So I'd say, I'm like, oh, okay. So I said, yeah, I'll meet with you and talk. The guy flies down here, meets at Ada, and he, this, this is a funny question that people in Oklahoma would never ask other people from Oklahoma. He said, do you know any Native Americans? <laughs> I, I'm like, I would really be hard pressed to find anybody whose family generations go very far back in Oklahoma that did not have at least some Native American in them. So I had a had a customer, and sadly he passed away uh, last year, named Tim Harjo, and he, he frequented uh, my music store. And I said, I bet Tim would be interested in helping out on this. So uh, young Tim met met with uh, with Bruce as well, and I said, "Here's my only stipulation. I know how these documentaries can work. You know, they take what you do and then make you look like a complete idiot. I've turned down several offers to be on TV shows since then. I said, "Here's my stipulation: Do not make me or anybody that I introduce you to look like an idiot." Okay, and he did. I said, if they make themselves look like an idiot, that's on them. But nothing is going to come back on me and, and make people mad at me. So anyway, he came down, met with Tim. Uh, how many of y'all knew Tim from around here? Okay, and his son, Kajot, uh, uh, took part in it as well. And I can tell you some stories, uh, which I'm going to have to because it's too funny. The last time I saw Tim before he died, he was in the store and we were laughing about this. So... On this trip, we meet with them in late November and we go do all the shooting. One of the cameramen, his name's Martin, and he's a little guy about my size. He goes, uh, Tim, if I really want a chance to see one of these things, what's the best thing I can do? And I'm like, oh, you don't know what you're doing here. Because, you know, Tim, if y'all know him, he had a sense of humor, very much so. So he goes, okay, here's what you do. Don't take a shower or anything the night before because the human, the sin of all that stuff will make them afraid of you. And he said, and you want to wear a shirt made out of a, you know what a toe sack is, potato sack? You want to wear a shirt made out of a toe sack. And I'm, and I'm thinking, nobody's going to fall for this. So the next morning, we're at Antlers, and Tim, it's like 4 in the morning. We're getting all the stuff. I, this is the most conglomeration of expensive equipment I've ever seen in my life. How many of y'all seen the documentary Bigfoot Bill? Okay, do you know there's a part in there where there's a shot of the camera going across these ice-covered mountains? If y'all remember that, I'm the one that shot that. The guy hands me this camera and says, here, go out and uh, shoot that. I said, how much does this thing cost? He goes, I don't worry about it, it's $100,000. <laughs> and I'm like, he goes, don't worry, it's insured. He said, I had two of them. I run over the one a month ago trying to get out of the war zone in Africa. Forgot I left it on the ground. So anyway... Uh, I filmed that, but the next morning, about four in the morning, we're getting all that together. Here comes Martin, which, give me one guess, how who had the toe sack just ready for him to put on. It was Tim. And uh, he's standing there, he's wearing this toe sack, not shaved or anything. 
Tim and Kanjot come walking out of their motel room, new cl fresh clothes on, <laughs> freshly showered, their hair wet, and this little English guy looks over me and goes, I've been had, <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, honestly, I'm, I'm surprised that you uh, fell for it. But, you know, these guys, they were uh, Brits. They were very good-natured about everything. It, it, was, a, it was a blast to, uh, to do that. So uh, if you haven't seen that, that show, that, that was something that I helped make. Most of the people on there are people that I introduced them to. Uh, there's a Seminole elder on a part of it that Tim is sitting by a fire with him that's over by a we woke and that was actually the last uh, scene that was shot I wasn't in that part but I was there and there's a part where Martin cameraman is has a camera on him and it's night vision and he's talking into it so that was on that uh, Seminole Elder's place and I was over there and this little uh, kid comes running up he said hey there's a white guy over there talking to a tree <laughs> so what Martin had done, he had set his camera up in the crook of the cedar tree and he was there and his little, little kid was out playing. He goes, there's some white guy over there. <laughs> like, you know, these people are crazy. <laughs> anyway, so I got, I've got some good memories about that. That's a, a once in a while kind of deal. So um, anyway, I've, right now I've got a YouTube channel called Bigfoot and More. Bigfoot because I'm interested in it. it it's just a fun mystery. It, it really is. And I uh, put the more on it just in case I wanted to put anything else on there. I've got some fishing videos and stuff like that too. Uh, a friend of mine in Massachusetts named uh, Cornell, he's an Irish guy, he's got a channel called No Such Thing Podcast. And he and I have started a, a dual podcast called Into the Void. And we just did our second show uh, last week where we interview people and, and, and talk to them. But um, yeah, Evans then mentioned my book. It's called The Champagne. Now, if you looked at the advertising for it, they spelt it the stamp. So it's, it's not a book about a terrifying stamp collection. So, but, but one thing I've always been interested in this subject is um, the people who are native to this continent um, throughout all North America, if there really is such a thing as Bigfoot, as what we've been reporting on since 1958 when Jerry Crew coined that term in Northern California and Humboldt County as they were cutting the logging road in, there really is such a thing as that. The people that have lived here for thousands of years should have something in their folklore and their history passed down. So I wanted to write a book, fictional book to start with. I've got a nonfiction book about all this stuff that I was just talking about that I'm editing right now, I'm putting pictures in, I hope to have it done by Christmas. Uh, but I wanted to write a fictional book from a, a native legend uh, that would be in this part of the country, Oklahoma based. So I come up with, and um, a couple of my uh, friends, Tim Harjo, one, another gentleman named Buck Byers from down uh, around the Tishomingo area, they were both customers, and I'd say, hey, what's, what's a Choctaw word for this? What's a Choctaw word? And they would fight, they would tell me. So if any of those words, any of you guys are native speakers here, if any of those are wrong, y'all can blame Tim or Buck. Because <laughs> I'm very conscious uh, about that. But uh, I asked Tim, I said, okay, what's the name for uh, that you would call like Bigfoot in Choctaw? And the word he said would be a good one to use would be Hatachito, which I, I think, does anybody speak Choctaw here? Um, which, from what he was saying, just means big man, like that, okay? Now, the champé, I've heard people say that's another word for Bigfoot. It is not. Okay, that goes back to um, uh, Choctaw legend all the way back to the, their homeland of Mississippi. And it, it, the description of it, it's a Bigfoot, but it's uh, described as a big, black, ogre-like monster that would live in the woods down there. And if you were hunting... It, or crossed his path, it would follow you just to kill you and eat you. So it was a cannibalistic ogre of the woods, basically. And if you were hunting and you had some game and it started after, you couldn't outrun it because it was incredibly fast, but maybe if you threw your game down, it would be interested in that and let you get away. So that was that. So I took that and tied it into our legend of Bigfoot and put the story in the mountains of southeast Oklahoma, which I've spent a lot of time down there, and if you have, you'll see that I'm very true to the uh, 
uh, to the landscape there. And if you'd like to read that book, I've got a copy of it here, and, I've, and, and it's for sale as well. Um, the one I've got that I'm writing on now, like I said, it is uh, basically documented all the uh, investigations I've been a part of. Well, not all of them. I've been doing this for like 25 years, so it's, it's been a long time. So what else? I, I didn't bring my notepad, so um, anyway, uh, we think a lot that the sightings of these things are all down in southeast Oklahoma. Well, they're not. There's some very close to here. Um, one of my friends is a doctor here in town, and he was here earlier. I'm not going to say his name because, but he actually had a sighting of two of these uh, creatures crossing the road in front of him back in 1989. He's a musician too, that's, that's how I know him. Another, there's a gentleman over by Central Homa that was out riding horses with some friends of his, and this was about 2001, and uh, they noticed something walking across a field way ahead of him. He said, the first thing I thought was ostrich, because it was real tall and dark, and he said, they got to look, he's like, no, that's a person. Why is he wearing all black? And then he gets to the fence, and he just steps over the fence and keeps going. So anyway, there, there's, a lot of things like this. So how common do I think these things are? Not. I mean, if they were, uh, the whole thing you said about the uh, guy having the trapping season, I'm like, okay, you got a lot of guys, one, if they fall for it and go out in the woods trying to trap a big foot, they're probably not very familiar with the woods anyway. So you got a lot of these guys tromping around the woods, digging holes, doing what God knows what with it, probably carrying high-powered rifles, Probably don't know much. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know, and of course I know it's a publicity stunt to get, you know, <laughs> tourism to Oklahoma. But uh, anyway, I'll see where my notepad here. What else? Um, I, I'd say we just take some questions. And, yeah, that's and, uh, and or hear some stories. That'd be great. I just um, wanted to say our group is definitely a no-kill group. We don't believe in trying to harvest a specimen. Uh, it'd be great if there was one somewhere, but we don't want something bad to happen. Uh, uh, we don't chase them through the woods. We, we try to set up and, and hopefully what we're doing will attract them to come. They're, they seem to be very curious. We want them to come check us out. Um, so we don't go running through the woods. We don't use flashlights. We go lights out, uh, which we hope will also make them curious. Like, who are these crazies out here? humans running around with no lights in the woods or, or whatever. So uh, that's kind of kind of how we do it. We, we, we don't chase them. Didn't want to throw this in. I forgot about this. This is my son Elijah over here. and He's been watching me run around the woods all, all his life in this. But uh, my friend from Massachusetts talking about Cornell, he actually has been down here twice and went with me in the Commission Mountains. Now last March, he came down and Elijah went with us. And we I've, all that footage is on my... Uh, my YouTube channel, Bigfoot and More. But late that second night we was there, and of course, I do everything wrong in bear country. I cook, I leave the food out, you know, because and then some people like, oh, you know, oh, scared bears. Well, I want to see the bear, okay? So everything's left out. Elijah cooked steak for us earlier today. All the cooking grease is still out. That night we, and Cornell actually recorded some whoops, tree knocks, and uh, things like that earlier in the night. But about 3.30, me and Elijah's in a tent. I usually don't sleep in a tent. If I'm by myself, I sleep on a hammock with a tarp over it. I just got this vision of a, of a tent being like a sack lunch for something high rate to be changed with me, you know, picked it up and run off. But anyway, it was blithering cold. It was, I remember how cold it got last winter. And Cornell from Massachusetts, he's acclimatized to it, and he's sleeping over in this other tent. And we're way back, way back in the in the time issues there. And about 3.30 in the morning, Cornell wakes us up yelling. He's going, Dave! He's Irish. He's got this thick Irish. He's, Dave! Dave! So there's something outside the tent? And he's just terrified, you know. So we get out. Nothing there. But he had heard something walk down the side of this ridge and it walked right up the side of his tent, which was against the woods there, and stopped. And he said... You know, this is what I come down here for. And he said, I was reduced to the kid that's terrified that the monster is coming out from under the bed. So we get out, and I'm thinking, well, first thought it was it's a bear. None of the food stuff was touched around camp. Whatever it was, just walked down the ridge and stood by his tent. We didn't see it, but um, you know what was it? 
who knows? But anyway, that, after that, he just matter of factly he goes, and I know he's going to be watching this. But he goes, I'm not sleeping in that tent. <laughs> I'm like, well, where are you going to sleep? He goes, I'll sleep in the back seat of your truck. I'm like, man, it's full of stuff. He goes, I don't care. I'll sleep in the front seat. Set up. <laughs> so the next, so we went back to sleep. Wake up the next morning. I look. And Cornell sitting in the front seat, his sleeping bag is over his head completely. And I, my first thought was like, he was cold. And I walked up and said, so you got cold? He goes, no. He said, you and Elijah got back in the tent. He said, I'm sitting here looking at all this glass. And he said, yeah. I thought, oh my God, what if it walks up and looks in the window? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that, that, was a, that was a good trip too. And I, and I still go, if I can get a friend to go with me that I, I know and Trust in the woods not to freak out and shoot me accidentally. I'll take them along. Otherwise, for the biggest part, I go down by myself and I'll stay a night or two. And and just uh, like I said, I don't chase after it because if you look at almost 99% of Bigfoot sightings, what are people doing? They're not running through the woods, beating on trees, making monkey noises and stuff. They accidentally are in the right place at the right time. One crosses the road in front of them or come to the edge of their camp while they're minding their business and somebody gets a sight of one. So me, I take my fishing gear and I just go camping and I just pay attention to what's going on around me and hope uh, hope one is uh, generous enough to show itself. So that's all I got. So I'm going to... Do you have any questions? Uh, something we didn't cover?